Welcome into another edition of Locked On Phillies. My name is Connor Thomas, your host, Talking Phillies on 97.5 The Fanatic. And now with you here on Locked On Phillies, we have a great crossover episode today with Lindsey Crosby with Locked On MLB Prospects. We're going to go through the Phillies farm system. Real quick before we get into that, I want to, of course, thank you for making Locked On Phillies your first listen every day. We are free and available wherever you get your podcast. Now, Let's jump into some of the prospect talks on the farm system the Phillies have, some guys who could make an impact at the major league level this year, and we'll even get into some questions about the guys on the major league team right now. Let's get going. You are locked on Phillies. Your daily Philadelphia Phillies podcast, part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. It's a crossover. Lindsey Crosby from Locked On MLB Prospects, Connor Thomas, Locked On Phillies. We're talking the Phillies farm system. Uh, and, and Connor, what are your thoughts about where the system is? Are Phillies fans excited about what's in there are you disappointed what are you kind of thinking about when it comes to the farm system yeah it's not really a great time uh to be a fan of the phillies farm system Uh, they don't have all that much in the tank from the fans perspective there are some younger guys that i know we're going to get into today that have some promise some of the recent high draft picks they've had the mick abels the painters the guys that they're going to see eventually at the major league level but right now like the up and coming hey we're going to see this guy get called up this year I, i mean you know, you cover the farm system and fans who follow the team know the Phillies don't have a lot in the tank. And part of that is because Matt Klintak didn't really do a great job of it in his time. And Dave Dabrowski has only had a year and change. He just reorged the entire front office system this past offseason as soon as the season ended in 2021. So it's going to take some time for him to take effect. It's kind of in the waiting game to see what Dabrowski can do. And we're left with the scraps of what Matt Klintak gave us, which is not all that much. Yeah, I was – when I was looking over this whole thing and getting ready for our episode, I was like, okay, who's going to be able to help Philly in 2022? And I'm like, okay, this is a little bit of a struggle. Uh, obviously the big guy, Bryson Stott, uh, shortstop second baseman, 2019 draft pick out of UNLV. And whenever you have a minor league, like the minor league player of the year for your organization is always somebody that you have to feel good about the year after they win that award. And he absolutely, I mean, 299, 390, 486, 16 homers, 10 stolen bases, really played well. And he went all the way from single A up to a 10 couple, a, a 10 game cameo in, in triple A, made the futures game, went to the fall league. You feel like he's ascended rather quickly, but it's worked out for him. I mean, he's he's gotten better plate discipline at the plate. Uh, he's he's picked up on the power. And I think he can debut in 2022. My question for you, I think, kind of would be. If if Bryson Stott is as good as he looked last year, which is still a question because he went through a lot of levels last year, what do the Phillies do with Didi Gregorius? Is that something where you you find places for both of them to play? Do you move on from Didi, dump the salary? What happens there? Mm-hmm. So Didi's in the last year of his deal. So that's the only reason the Phillies already haven't moved on for him. Or I think they would have following what he did in 2021. He had a really down year. He had an elbow issue. Uh, that was really from opening day on that I think hampered him a lot. But mm-hmm. still, he just wasn't the same guy in the field. He didn't give them all that much to play either. And it's, it sucks because he looked great in 2020 in his first year with the club in the shortened season. And then he came out and he was disappointing. So I don't think they'd have any reservations from putting Bryson Stott in that spot. If he looks as good at AAA and then if he gets the call up this year, I think he's absolutely going to be a guy they want to look at because dee has gone after this season anyway. And there were points last year – where they were trying, I mean, they went and got Freddie Galvis right before the trade deadline to take mm-hmm. some time at that position because they didn't trust Didi there. I don't think they'd have any trouble moving on to put Bryce in there and get him used to being the future of shortstop in Philly. Yeah, and and he's a guy that defensively should be able to stick at shortstop. I mean, he he played second and third at the alternate site. We've seen him do some of each, but he has the range, he has the arm, he has the instincts to stick at short. And so I actually like the short-term pairing of him and Freddie Galvis as far as short and second, you know, turning double plays and letting the veteran mentor the young guy. It kind of reminds me of when the Braves 
had Dansby Swanson and Ozzy Albies. Mm-hmm. And Brandon Phillips was playing second for Atlanta. And they were using Brandon Phillips' veteran presence to kind of mentor the younger guys into those roles. So yeah, not a bad little, guy to learn from, huh? <laughs> exactly. Not yeah. Freddie Galvis, not a bad guy to learn from. Um, and then looking at some of the other players who might be able to impact the big league team this year, uh, catcher Logan O'Hop. He's a we talked catchers all yesterday on Locked On Farm and 2018. 23rd round pick out of high school. You don't see a lot of, of high school catchers being drafted anymore, uh, but he's loved it within the organization. Just, I mean, the work ethic, the dedication, the makeup really has the intangibles. And then we saw him make it to AAA last year, went to the Arizona Fall League, but also looked good. 270, 331, 458, um, 17 home runs in about 100 games. And I think he's a better defensive catcher than an offensive catcher. But he looks really good, and I think that once he can get some offensive tweaks in 2022, just working to cut down the swing and miss and everything in his profile, he should be able to debut. And if he does, what do you do with him and JT Real Muto? Because one of the big things we talk about with catchers is they need reps. They need to catch every, you know, like four days, five days a week. And so you've got a great catcher in Real Muto. You have Logan O'Hop. How do you find the playing time for both? So there's kind of a Rubik's Cube going on with the Phillies that was unleashed with the the universal DH decision that the Mm -hmm. MLB is making. So now that you have the DH, the Phillies have a couple guys that could slot in there really well. The two that seem to make the most sense are Reese Hoskins and Alec Bohm, who were both terrible defensively last year. And the Phillies have been waiting for this day so they can get one of those guys out of the field, stop butchering ground balls. But JT's another guy that he's – great offensively as a catcher Mm -hmm. and they've got him on a longer term deal after the contract that he signed last season so if you get to that point where you want to call up you can put jt in that dh role more often now it's probably going to mean that you have to play a guy at first and a guy at third that's going to be a downgrade defensively compared to what they would be if you put them in the designated hitter role and got a better defensive option but i think the phillies would be welcome to put jt in that dh role not Daily, obviously, you need him behind the plate. But if Logan O'Hop wants to come up, and he's a good defensive replacement, and you could put him in the nine hole and let JT still bat in the cleanup or the five hole and play that DH role, I think that would be a great move by the Phillies to get him some reps at the position. And my thought when it comes to that as well is Brad Miller. I know he's a free agent, but Brad mm-hmm. Miller seems to be a guy that does really well against righties and then just can't hit a lefty to save his life. Yeah. But I feel like every time he's – He's in, he's hitting tanks. And so I can see a lineup where you're facing a righty. You've got Brad Miller in there, either at DH or first base. I think Real Muto played like three games at first base last year. But yeah. Real Muto could could DH. Brian Miller could could play first. And then you could have Hop in there as well and just uh, oh hop and just try to find a way to get all those guys in. But again, he is a free agent right now. We can't do anything with those guys. So it's unfortunately it's yeah. kind of one of those questions. Um, okay, another guy who I think could could compete, and a, a, a listener actually asked me to ask you about this guy. So outfielder Matt Verling, fifth round pick out of 2018 from Notre Dame, mm. uh, came up to the big league level during the wild card chase, and a lot of swing and miss in his game, but crushed some balls. I mean, some hard hit percentage of like 53%. Uh, some some good exit velos, 115, 116, things like that. And it seems like he's a very, very good athlete and can play a decent defense. Is he a legitimate candidate for an outfield spot this year? It depends. Like the tough thing with the outfield spot, the Phillies lost Oduble Herrera in center. They lost mm-hmm. Andrew McCutcheon in left. Neither of those guys are going to be back regardless of what happens with free agency. So you've got to fill those two spots. And if the Phillies want to go out and spend and actually throw money and they look at their roster and say, hey, we've got the reigning NL MVP in Bryce Harper. Hey, we have the reigning runner-up in the Cy Young race in Zach Wheeler. Maybe we go throw money at Nick Castellanos and we fill one of those outfield spots. It really depends if they throw big money at a big-name free agent. If not, I could see him absolutely playing the corner outfield spot out there and left. I could see them, and the Phillies had a bit of a rotating door in outfield, switching positions a lot with what was going on with their center field position last year. He's athletic. He can play around. I also think, he has a little bit of ability at first base if Reese Hoskins really falls apart defensively. It's mm-hmm. something I believe he played a couple games at first last year when he came up. And yeah. I yeah, and I think if that becomes an issue again, Reese Hoskins defense, that is, and he becomes the universal day, uh, DH 
day in and day out. That could be another spot where Veerling gets some time with a major league club. So, so might start at AAA, but probably feels like he has a pretty good chance to make an impact uh, in Philadelphia next year, provided that the team doesn't go out and spend a bunch of money. I, th- I think that's a pretty good synopsis of, of offensively he's there as long as he can not strike out so much, but we just have to find a spot for him. Um, yeah, and the Phillies lineup is good enough that some of these young guys, the Bryson Stott, the Veerling, like they can come up and they can be protected by having a lineup that includes Reese Hoskins, Bryce Harper, J.G. Romuto, Gene Segura, who batted 300 last year. Like, these guys can cover up for these younger guys and get them better opportunity, especially now that you don't have a pitcher spot to worry about. We'll be right back with Lindsay in a second to talk some more Phillies prospects. But first, I want to tell you about my friends over at Built Bar. This is the time of the year that resolutions have normally gone way out the window. We're almost into March at this point. But Built Bar wants to make sure you're keeping up with your decision to eat right. Have you tried their puffs? If you haven't, you're missing one of their best tasting bars. Their protein-infused marshmallow, the first of their kind. Plus, they've got 100% real chocolate and some great flavors like yummy cinnamon churro, coconut marshmallow, and banana cream pie. They also have the regular bars. If you don't want to try the marshmallow, some great flavors and new ones coming out all the time. Most Built Bars contain 130 calories, 4 grams of sugar, four net carbs, and 17 grams of protein. Man, when you compare that to your regular candy bar, there's no competition whatsoever. The Built Bars is better for you, and they taste amazing too. Mint brownie, coconut, coconut almond, these are all the flavors you can try when you try Built Bar. At Built Bar, they're all about the taste. They make it taste delicious first, then figure out how to make it healthy. And I don't know how, but they pull it off every single day time. Go to built.com, use promo code LOCK15 and get 15% off your order. That's promo code LOCK15 for 15% off at built.com. This episode's also brought to you by Rock Auto. With the ever-increasing number of makes and models, it's impossible for your local chain to cover all of the stock auto parts that you need. So why endure the pointless issues that you have when you go to those local chains? Instead, you've got to go to rockauto.com. You can do all the work that you normally have people at the store do at home, on your computer, and you can actually do it right. You save time and money when using Rock Auto. So why choose to spend 30%, 50%, even 100% more at that store? Just use rockauto.com and do it all from home. They're a family business. They've been serving do-it-yourselfers for over 20 years, and their prices have been reliably low the entire time. They have everything you can need. Brake parts, tail lamps, motor oil. Man, the list goes on and on. If you need anything car or truck related, you've got to go to rockauto.com. So go to rockauto.com right now and see all the parts available for your car or truck. Right locked on in there. How did you hear about a section? So they know we sent you in. Amazing selection, reliably low prices, All the parts your car will ever need. That's rockauto.com. Exactly. All right. So talk some of the high-level guys that that are going to impact the team this year. But there's a lot of guys in the lower levels of the minors that have talent. And it's a a ton of pitchers. And so this is where a big part of the Baseball America love of the organization and some of the prospect groups comes from. Uh, And it, it all starts with Mick Abel. 6'5", 190, first round pick in 2020 out of high school. So we have a thing on on my show about about pre- pe- pitchers having a little bit more risk of their profile. But he's a guy who, despite missing some time last year with a shoulder injury, just feels like he's got four really good pitches and th- the right work ethic to, to make it work and be a front to middle of the rotation kind of guy. Yeah, I love the stuff from Mick Abel. And the Phillies... Like being a Phillies fan, you want an arm to come up through the system so bad. Really, the only one that's worked out to any degree at the major league level since, I don't know, Cole Hamels is Aaron Nola. And last year, he had a bit of a regression year. Like it's really rare over the past couple of years to see one of these power arms get drafted high, come up through the system, and actually make an impact at the major league level. And it looks like that's going to be Mick Abel. I mean, everything I'm seeing from him is great. I, the shoulder thing, it doesn't really concern me all that much because the Phillies have a track record of being overly cautious with their minor league arms. They take so long to get these guys. You saw it with Spencer Howard. 
when he was with the team before he got moved to Texas at last year's trade deadline. They refused to throw the guy more than like two or three innings, which I thought was crazy. But a long story short, I think they'll be able to protect his arm. I think McCabe will be able to stay healthy. And I love the stuff seeing from him as a top end of the guy, uh, top end of the rotation guy in the future. Yeah, and and talk about the shoulder injury. He made it to instructs this fall, so I mean it's something where, like you said, they're being cautious. He is fine, and all the reports are the fastball still mid to upper nineties. It can hit ninety nine. It's got a ton of spin to it, and that's kind of the thing I've noticed for him is just tons of spin to everything. His slider was before the draft considered one of the like the best breaking pitch in that prep class, uh, and it is as true as advertised. And the thing that I love when I watch Mick Abel is the slider especially, but the changeup as well too, they tunnel really well off the fastball. And so even if they weren't plus pitches, you still can disguise them better because they're coming off of such a good fastball, but they're also great pitches in and of themselves. And so guy to be excited about, guy to really look forward to. And I'm, I'm curious to see what level they put him in this year and, and how he looks as he gets a, more of a look at professional pitching. But then Andrew Painter. So... 2021 first round pick another mm. prep pitcher got you know young six seven two fifteen he's a big boy huge um, yeah. yeah but I see him another one of those future number two number three kind of guys uh, same thing four pitches that are fifty grade or higher and I mean whether it's the uh, the fastball the changeup the slider a curve that he is is average but can be much better and can kind of flash that um, another guy power pitcher. You want to see him develop a little bit physically, but feels like he can be an impact arm. Uh, just get him in a full, get him in full season ball this year. Uh, get him on a good nutrition plan, good physical development plan, and give it a couple of years. And I think you're going to have a good kid here. Yeah, you've already got the power, and it's, it's funny to say like he's got to mature physically, being a six seven. Like he's already a huge dude, but with that frame, he's going to be incredible. And it's it's so cool because what the Phillies did with these two guys, with Panther and Abel is it's weird to say again because Andrew Painter is bigger than Mick Abel, but he's like Mick Abel light. They saw what Abel was doing as a prep rate handed pitcher in the system already, and they felt comfortable to go out and basically do it again and try and repeat it with Andrew Painter. Obviously less of a sample size so far, but the bigger size, the velocity, the power, the plus pitches you were talking about. I love what I've seen from the kids so far in the minimal time that we have, and he's a guy that if he continues on the same path, like this is what you need to rebuild a farm system. You don't need just a McAble. You need a McAble and then two more guys behind him that are going to be part of that rotation that you can actually fill it out in the future when it comes to the 2025, 26, whenever these guys end up actually up. So I'm excited to see how he develops this year. too. Yeah. And the thing about Painter that I love more than anything is he is unafraid to throw that change up to any batter in any count, no matter what. And that kind of just pure confidence in your stuff and in, off-speed stuff, not even necessarily the fastball, is right. is great. I mean, the, the fastball touches 98, and then he can throw that that change at like a high 80s. You get a good spread in the difference there. Mm-hmm. But just the confidence to do that uh, absolutely blows my mind, and and I, I I I just love to see it. And when you t- and then it's not all pitchers at that kind of those lower levels. Um, outfitter Johan Rojas, 2018 IFA from the Dominican. Yep. and had a great 2021. I mean, just absolutely killed it. I think he batted like 262, 330, 417, 34 stolen bases and 381 at-bats. And so the the projection on him has changed a bit where they're looking at him now. His projection's like an everyday center fielder with some all-star upside. Yeah. Um, and I think the big thing here is defensively, we knew he was one of the better athletes in the system. Like him and Yosar Garcia were kind of right there neck and neck for it. But offensively, he got a lot better at the plate. And just specifically, like not recognizing the spin, recognizing off-speed stuff, and then not having as much swing and miss. And so he's a guy where, obviously not going to help this year. You have outfield questions. But those IFAs, you look at six years, you expect them to be up. He's a guy in a few years that, um, can definitely step in next to the, the the back half of Bryce Harper's contract and hold down center field for you. Yeah, for sure. And I actually, that's what I was doing right before I jumped on here today. I went and checked out some video of him because I haven't seen that much of him. And your assessment's absolutely right. Like he's twitchy fast. His athleticism jumps off the screen. Even just like watching him leg out a couple singles, everything like that, trying to beat out ground ball. You could just tell the dude was built to be an athlete. I love mm-hmm. that defensively. 
Um, yeah, he's got to progress. And for me, just the little bit of clips I saw kind of echo what you were talking about, of cutting down on the swing and misses, tracking the ball better, picking up off speed. You could tell that he was really, really working hard in the at-bats that I was watching, him trying to track the ball into the mitt, and he wasn't reading it as well as you'd like to see a player at the major league level. But the offense, it, it comes. It takes some time for guys, but athletes like that, will always be able to play the defensive position just because of their speed. And the 34 stolen bases, man, the Phillies need some speed like that at the top of the lineup. They love to run. Like Bryce Harper loves to do it. They're a team that likes to be aggressive. I would love to see a guy like that make a debut at some point in the – hopefully nearer than later future. Yeah, I mean, it's just – it's something where the power is coming. And those – Super athletic guys. Right now, you have to be a little more patient with them because they lost the 2020 season. And so many of those younger right. prospects, they're the ones who – they have the physical talents. They have to learn the mental side. And when you lose a year of of live game action, it takes at least that, that amount of time to catch back up. So I expect him uh, probably to get a decently aggressive assignment this year. I expect him to do pretty well from what I've seen. And if that's the case, I mean, he's going to be able to impact sooner rather than later. Now, and let then, me ask you real quick before we move yeah. on. Uh, a comp for him. Would it be fair? Is he in the Byron Buxton type of frame of an outfielder? I know that's lofty, but is right. that the type of a comp that you could see potentially an upside? Or is there, is there a better one in your mind? So, so athletically, the way he plays defense, absolutely. That kind of Byron Buxton uh, speed you know, good bat speed, barrel of mistake kind of guy. The power okay. isn't there like Buxton has. And again, gotcha. it's, I mean, he's he was a 2018 signee. They signed at 16. He's 19, 20 years old. That's going to come. But right. he has the bat speed to pick the power up. But okay. watching him play defense, he very much reminds me of kind of like the gliding motions that a Byron Buxton has just with that, I mean, plus, plus speed. He yeah. has a really good arm as well. And so I think that's a good comp for him provided that one Buxton stays healthy and then provided that his power comes that's a pretty decent comp yeah hey man I'll take Buxton in the field even if he's not Buxton <laughs> at the dish I would love that and I'm sure Phillies fans would too absolutely and another guy who is kind of the opposite of Johan Rojas but somebody who I've actually had a chance to see personally a little bit is outfielder Eth uh, Ethan Wilson so second round pick out of South Alabama last year, 6'1", 210, probably going to be a left fielder. And like I said, kind of the opposite. He has he has the power, yeah. um, you know, qu quality at bats, plus power to all fields, but doesn't run very well, doesn't throw very well. So he's probably going to be like a left fielder, DH kind of guy, but someone who, who, I mean, has the ceiling of a 30 home run guy in the major leagues. And, and just the question here is, um, can he get everything else to the level where he can contribute at a big league level? Because right now, like I said, doesn't run well, doesn't throw well, but can hit absolute tanks. And that's always a skill you can use at, at the major league level. Yeah, no doubt. And the Phillies certainly need that. They had a little bit, they've had, I think, four different pitching coaches in the past five years because they got caught up in this whole launch angle, uh, like fanatical time period, which that's a whole nother conversation. The point being, mm -hmm. they've lost some of the power that they saw from guys coming. Reese Hoskins had a stretch where he was trying to figure out his swing. They lost the power at it. Alec Bohm, you see a big guy, big lanky, rangy guy that feels like he should be able to hit from power, hasn't done it at the major league level. To have a prospect that can come up and be one of those 30 homer guys. And if he gets up there to the point where like Bryce Harper is still playing at this type of level or close to it, having another guy in the outfield that could be that power bat, that would be awesome to add that to the lineup. I mean, especially in Citizens Bank Park, he'd be hitting nukes. Would love yeah. it. Yeah. And he's one of those guys that definitely benefits from adding the universal DH and having one more spot for an offensive first guy. Right. Uh, but you touched on it. We'll be right back with Lindsay for our final segment where we take a look at some MLB level questions surrounding the Phillies. But first, I want to tell you about my good friends over at Bet Online. Football season, it might be over, but basketball is in full steam, both for the pro and college levels. The tournament, right around the corner in March. So, from all the latest odds, totals, player performance props to where the next fired coach is going to land, betonline.net, they're your number one spot for all of your sports betting needs. BetOnline remains the best spot for all of your sports scores, podcasts, 
and news this season. I've been using them to check in on all of the latest lines surrounding James Harden and his arrival in Philadelphia. And it's not just basketball. BetOnline.net is your source for hockey, boxing, UFC odds, right down to the Olympic coverage. They covered the Winter Olympics and gave out some great info on that. So head to the website today or use your mobile device to learn more about the trends in action. Bet online, where the game starts. Touched on Alec Boehm. I kind of want to get into a conversation about the big league roster, if we can, for a minute. Because sure. we have some of these guys that we've talked about. Alec Boehm, Aaron Nola, who maybe necessarily didn't have the best seasons in 2021. Uh, can Alec Bohm rebound? Is this like, is it realistic that he gets back to the Alec Bohm that we knew of, maybe with the new hitting coach, or is it something where, where he's probably looks closer to who wait, he probably is closer to who he looked like in 2021 versus previous years? Yeah, that's the million dollar question, and I don't know that it's the hitting coach. I think it's always been a mental type of thing for Alec Bohm, and I think where it starts is his defense. Mm -hmm. Last year, his issue with he was hitting the ball all right to start the year, but was terrible defensively, basically opening day to when he was sent down, which was to be in the conversation for NL Rookie of the Year in 2020 and then be sent down the next year because you can't hit anything and you can't field anything is a huge drop off. The good thing is, and I think if I had to bet my money, he probably sees in the first two months of the season the most time at the designated hitter position for the major league club because I think that defense weighed so much on his mind. It took him fully out of his approach at the plate. Instead of attacking the baseball, he was just kind of swatting stuff the other way, and it really just ruined the whole profile of who he is as a player. Without the defense weighing on his mind, I think he's the best option to put at DH because he could just focus on building that approach, getting back to the guy that you saw in the short season in 2020 that would hit for a little bit of power but was just a clutch hitter, hit a solid average for a guy who had just gotten called up. I think he's going to benefit more than anyone else on this roster from the universal DH. And I think that mentality, I don't know that he is what he was or he's going to be this year, what he looked like he could be during his rookie season. But I think he gets closer to that than what we saw last season when he completely collapsed. Valid. That's good. That's good. And, and when we're looking at the big league squad, also I have to ask about some of the pitchers. So, so Ranger Suarez moves to the rotation and 1.36 ERA. Is that repeatable? Because when I go back and I look at some of the advanced stats, and, and folks who watch my show a lot know that I'm not as big on the advanced stats. I like the in-person scouting and you know the written reports. But when you I'm look at some that. of the advanced stats, yeah, like the fielding independent pitching's like 272. There's a big discrepancy there. And so it feels like he's going to regress a bit to the mean. Who is the real Ranger Suarez? Is he the guy we saw in 2021 starting? Is he the reliever we saw in 2019? Like, where is the who is the real guy? He's more the guy that we saw last year than what we saw when he was in the bullpen. But okay. he's not a surprise anymore. You see it all the time. These guys can come on. And for him, it wasn't his first foray in the major leagues, but it was his first extended time getting – the starting rotation time last year. Now that you see that, when teams look at the scouting report and they see Ranger Suarez this year, it isn't the fourth or fifth arm in the rotation. It's going to be a guy that they saw be elite at points in 2021. So I think the focus on him, they'll have the natural regression. But the upside, I'm higher than most on the Phillies rotation. You look at some of the other guys that are going to share time in that rotation with him. Aaron Nola, Zach Wheeler, who we talked about being the runner-up for the NL Cy Young, Zach Eflin, who still has good stuff for a three and has potential to be mm -hmm. better than that. Kyle Gibson, who's better than a three, I think, and is going to slot into that spot because Aaron Nola is so good. Zach Wheeler is so good. All those guys. And then you have Ranger Suarez as well. I don't think it'll be as big of a regression as the numbers might show because he's going to be covered up by some other really good arms. He's still probably going to be the number four arm out of that uh, rotation, I would guess, three or four. But having those two guys at the top, not being forced into being an ace on the staff or a number one on a staff mm -hmm. or even a two, I think saves them a little bit from the regression that you might feel is coming. Okay. I mean, it's – and it's something where I want him to be good. When I look at the yeah, division right? as a whole and I kind of look at, you know, what everybody has – uh, you have to respect that the Mets have Jacob DeGrom and Max Scherzer. I mean, I'm not going to respect it. I, I, you don't have <laughs> you're, to make me respect right. the Mets. No. <laughs> but, uh, you know, and then like the Braves have the big three of Freed and Anderson and Morton. But yeah. I think top to bottom, the Phillies rotation 
feels like it's the most proven of all of these teams as far as the one through five with who these guys are and who we know that they are. Like the Marlins have a lot of talent, but a lot of unproven talent in the rotation. So, so not to put you on the spot. I know I, I don't want you to get you know mad with your listeners or anything, but me kind of looking at like from the outside at the division and trying to project out uh, where I think teams will go. I see Philly as this is kind of the year for them to figure out some of the position player spots. And then next year's the year they make the big run. I kind of had them at third in the division behind Atlanta in the Mets. Although it's really hard to assume the Mets aren't going to Mets it up. Yeah. In, right. In, in August and September. I mean, it's, it's really hard to be like, yeah, the Mets are not going to screw it up somehow. Yeah, um, because but, we were in the same spot last year, right? Yeah, the like Mets. the Mets were leading the division until July, and then they just forgot how to play baseball. Yeah. Uh, but, and th- I think the reason, though, that I have them third is when I look at the farm system, and that's just, that's my focus in the way I see things, it reminds me a lot of, like, the Angels system. Like, some there's some great talent, and some weak spot on the roster, not a ton of help coming from the farm this year, and then it feels like ownership spends money like big money in short bursts you know the Mm -hmm. obviously the bryce harper deal the real muto extension but doesn't consistently spend a bunch of money to plug holes at the big league level and so without knowing for sure how much the pocketbook's going to open up after the lockout's over it's hard for me to move them up somewhere from like an 83 and 79 or something like that Mm-hmm. You know. Well, they were fifth in payroll last year, so they did spend like they were spending a good amount. But you're right; it's spread out. It's they spent a lot on Bryce Harper, took some time off, spent a lot on JT, took some time off, and in between that, the JT extension. I mean, in between that, they bring in Zach Wheeler and throw him some money. Mm-hmm. But you're right; I can't really argue with them being third in the division. I'm sorry out there to the Philly fans listening that want me to say, "Oh yeah, first they're going to be a hot team; they're going to win the World Series." I can't argue it because the Mets are so talented, even though they have that, that black cloud hanging over the organization. The money that Steve Cohen has just thrown at his baseball team is unbelievable. I do think, though, if they're going to catch one of those two teams, I'm really, really interested on one man's future, and that's Freddie Freeman. Right. Depending on where he ends up, like I don't care about the talent that the Braves have. I don't care what Austin Riley did, what Ronald Acuna is when he comes back. Like I, I don't care about any of that because – the leadership with a ball club like that, that is so young, despite winning the world series last year, there's still a largely younger team. If you lose the leader in your clubhouse and Freddie Freeman, who also is like an MVP two years ago, a great player, that Mm -hmm. team could totally regress. They could be a totally different field. And we know how important clubhouses are for baseball, maybe more so in any other sport because of the length of the season, they're a totally different team without him. So until he actually inks a contract, to keep him in Atlanta, I think the Phillies might be able to make a little bit of noise compared to the Braves, but I can't argue at the current time, assuming he's back with your projection of third. That makes perfect sense to me, and I'm about right on with what you're saying. Yeah. All right, so for folks who are listening to my show who want more information on the Phillies and to follow you, how can they do that? So you can follow us on Twitter at LO underscore Phillies. That's the account for Locked On Phillies. You can subscribe to us on YouTube, Locked On Phillies. You'll be able to see this video there. You can find my personal account on Twitter at Connor Thomas 975 which you see on the bottom of the nice screen here in our little lower third graphic that you uh, beautifully set up for us, Lindsay. Uh, and that's uh, all the information you can need day in and day out on the Phillies. You can find it those three accounts. And I am on Twitter at Crosby Baseball. My show is on Twitter at Locked On Farm. And you can find us on YouTube or wherever you get your your podcast, Locked on MLB Prospects. Uh, Connor, had a great time, man. Thanks a lot. It was a lot of fun. Appreciate you having me, Lindsay. Absolutely. That does it for our first ever crossover episode during my time as host of Locked on Phillies. Man, that was fun. Lindsay knows all of his stuff about the farm, and that was an awesome experience to get to run through that. Hopefully you enjoyed it as much as I do. Thanks for making Locked on Phillies your first listen Every day now, make your second listen locked on MLB. Paul Francis Sullivan, make sure, please call him Sully. He brings you his unique perspective on the major leagues, past and present. It's free and available wherever you get your podcasts. That's all we have for you today. And I will talk to you again next time, right here at Locked On Phillies.